There we go. How's your spring break, Luis? Good. Oh, uh, uneventful, which is good, I suppose. Just spent creating, preparing, got the classroom <laughs> set up, working on the seating charts. Hi, Mike, how you doing? You can sit wherever you want, Mike, as long as you're three feet away from somebody else. So what'd you do over spring break, Mike? Yeah. I have a hard time getting into it this year. Yeah, I didn't watch much of the. I watched most of the videos. Yeah. Watched a little bit of a documentary on World War One. The more I watch this series, I realize they shouldn't even talk about World War Two. They should just teach World War One. Because. Like World War II is just the epilogue of World War. It's just the it's just a continuation. If you read what happened in World War One, oh my gosh, the atrocities and all the bad stuff that went on. It was just as bad as World War Two. What's going on, Grim? Same thing we do every day. We try to take over the world. Yep. Thank you. I, I, it's not too much longer that I, people will still catch that reference. Oh. <laughs> Pinky and the Brain. It's a cartoon. Uh, the two lab lab mice. So you can sit wherever you want as long as you're three feet away from somebody else. How was your spring break, Adriana? It was boring. I didn't do anything. Neither did I. <laughs> I graded papers, and that's about it. Good morning, Ava. Good morning, Ian. Weren't you sitting at that desk before? Yeah. How does your desk feel? Uh, Ethan, how do you like your desk? Better or worse than the other one? You find it okay, Luis? You like it? What about you, Aiden? You like that table? Is it? Sit back. That's when things gonna suck. Is that um, when we have? I'm gonna have twenty seven kids in here. I'm gonna have to go like use the two lab tips. So I'm gonna have four than four. So hopefully they can see from back there. Otherwise, we'll have to do something different. Uh, I don't know. You can probably. I think you can hear me okay. Two more minutes. How you doing, Jurens? Pretty good. How are you, Strauss? All right. How'd you, did you like that lab? It was pretty fun. 
calculations kind of took a little long time, but it took a long it time. I suppose I should get myself ready here to teach. Nobody wants to sit up in front, huh? They're all afraid of me. Good morning, Jackson Penn. Good morning, Ari. Oh, that's the bell. We're ready to start. <clears throat> so, um, first thing I'll mention is um, nice job in the labs. Uh, you guys put in, I know that there was a lot of calculations on that lab. Um, and I honestly think the, the bigger lesson to learn from that lab is not like equilibrium calculations, but how do you budget your time like in a college setting. Um, some of you came to my Zoom Wednesday to get extra help. And that's really what you have to do in college. You know, the, you, people say, oh, I'm not smart. I'm not, it, it has nothing to do with intelligence. You're, you're all smart. Okay, there's nothing wrong with your brains. Okay, there, there's nothing wrong with your brains. They all function correctly. It's about organizational and time skills. That's what's gonna make and break you. So, um, so when you got help on Wednesday, you still had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Oh, pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, the God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So you still had um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday to get help. If you waited till Monday night, you are in a world of hurt. And that, that's why I actually made the lab do Friday, quote unquote, was to get the procrastinators to do their lab Friday because they'd be like, oh crap, it's due Friday, instead of saying, oh crap, it's due Tuesday. So um, that, that's why I did that um, so that it would get spur you to try to get it in um, by this morning. What? Oh, I got five people been waiting. Uh, Is that they're all in here? All right, there you go. Um, the only comment on the lab was like for the errors. On the very first page of the lab, it said that the um, hydrothiocyanate acid was um, would decompose over time. So let me. So this breaks down. Oh, I didn't share my screen here. I'm out of practice. I am the host. So this stuff breaks down over time, the hydrothiol, and that's why when we first started doing it, they weren't turning red because this had already broken down. So then I quickly made up a solution again, but that's honestly the biggest error. And it said it nice in italics on the very first page of the lab, which you read said, you must complete this lab within an hour because the HCN begins to break down. So um, that was, I mean, yeah, there are other errors in the lab. I just got to turn that beeping off like um, getting fingerprints on the cuvette. Um, but, you know, you don't want to have something vague like, oh, I pipetted wrong. Like, so that sort of error won't fly in college. You need to be, you know, specific, okay? 
So we don't, I was tempted to do one more lab this week, but I thought that'd be too stressful for you guys to try to squeeze it in because I'm sure you got other stuff going on in your other classes that are due this week. So we're just going to work on some homework problems um, and try to keep it a little bit more relaxed this final week. So, all right. So um, if you're, uh, if there aren't any other questions, we're going to start taking notes on buffers. And just a reminder, I've got the chat room up and everybody can see it in the classroom. So. All right. Um, buffers are really important to understand for biochemistry and biological systems so much that when you, you um, go to college, Mike, you'll take an entire class, entire semester on just buffers. So a buffer resists changes in pH. That's good for a biological system because if you drink acidic soda, you don't want the pH of your blood to change. If you drink basic milk, you don't want the pH of your blood to change. You want the pH of your blood to be constant. You want the pH of your mouth to be constant, okay? Um, do not try to drink a gallon of milk at one sitting, you will vomit. Milk is a base. You drink a gallon of milk at one sitting, it will change your stomach from acidic to basic and then you throw up. So do not do the milk challenge. The, the outcome is automatic because your stomach is not buffered, okay? A buffer is when you've got a weak acid. So let me write that twice. It's when you have got a weak acid and a salt or a weak base and a salt. That's what creates a buffer. When you think about it, it's pretty amazing. Your blood is always at a pH of 7.2. Keeps it pretty much regulated, your, your body system. So let's take a look at um, an example here of a buffer. Let's do um, acetic acid. Wow, that's pretty cool, Ava. I hope you told him about uh, acids and bases after he threw up. So, um, so now we need a salt. It can be any type of salt. The easiest one is just to take that. Well, like conjugate salt. So I gotta take the acetate part. So that part has to be the same, okay? The cation out here, it could be really anything. Potassium, lithium, magnesium, calcium, you name it. But it's just easy. We all know sodium pretty well. It's a pretty common element. It's all sodium. So we're going to go with a 0.1 molar solution of this, a 0.1 molar solution of this. So first, we'll just talk about in general, why don't buffers change their pH? So So your weak acid is going to break apart and give you this, right? So 
So my initial concentration of this is 0.1 molar. And I got 0.1 molar of this. Why do I have 0.1 molar of this? Because of my salt. The salt breaks apart 100%. Remember, So if I have 0.1 molar of this, I'm going to generate 0.1 molar of that. Okay. So I don't think you need to write down the equation for the salt. You know that it breaks apart, right? The only reason why I say that is because I want some space down here. So the salt will break apart, and that's why you initially start off with that amount. Okay. So now let's say we add an acid. So this. To add an acid, in this case, let's say HCl. So I do want you to write these equations, th these equations down. So I add an acid there, Ari. HCl gives me H plus plus Cl. So what's going to happen to my concentration of H plus? It's going to go up, right? But what does Le Chatelier's principle say is going to happen? If the H plus goes up, what's going to happen to my reaction, Mike? Is it going to shift left or shift right? So if I add acid, my reaction is going to shift left and decrease the H plus. So even though I increased H plus from adding an acid, it shifts left and then decreases it. So it counteracts what I just did. I added acid, but it shifted left. It reacted with the acid so that the pH stays the same. And the same thing happens if you add a base. So, so yeah, I'm going a little too fast. And don't forget, Ian, Calder, Zoe, if I go too fast, just tell me to slow down. So what's going to happen if I add a base? The OH is going to react with the H plus. We're going to get water. So if the concentration of H plus decreases, my reaction is going to shift right to increase the amount of H plus. So that's basically why a buffer does not change pH. Now there's a limit, you know, a buffer isn't perfect. Just like Ava's brother, he kept drinking base, 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 and eventually the system broke. Okay. It's the same thing with you guys, you know, your body's buffered, but eventually, I mean, if you stop breathing, your blood will slowly become more and more and more and more acidic until eventually it becomes acidic. And if your pH drops to 6.8, then you go unconscious, but you're probably already unconscious because you stopped breathing. So, um, so there's a limit, okay? Any questions so far before we actually start doing math?
No. So the question is like, if we got rid of the salt, that means we're starting with zero here. So you can't shift left because there's nothing for it to react with. So like if you added HCl to, the, to this where there's no salt, yes, this increases, but I can't shift left because I have nothing to react with. I have no acetate to react with, okay? The base, if I added base, it would resist the pH for a little bit because I do have, whoops, I do have some acid to react with, okay? All right, so we are going to do a, a really long, massive problem that will take the whole hour. So settle in, make yourself comfortable, we're going to draw a graph. Because this graph is going to say, where are you on this titration curve? So I'm going to have um, on the y axis pH. pH goes from 0 to 14. 7 in the middle. <clears throat> and this is going to be volume of sodium hydroxide added. And there really is no shortcut to doing this. But again, that's why if you can do something that somebody else can't, you will get paid lots of money. Right, Mike? If you can throw a football <clears throat> through the window of a moving car at 20 miles an hour, you're gonna make $10 million a year. All right, so when I mean titration, it means adding a strong acid or base to a buffered system. Titration means you're going to add a strong acid or base to a buffer. This was the lab that we were going to do. We were going to actually do this, but I kind of felt it'd be too stressful for you guys. It's we did the we did the two most difficult labs all year: the equilibrium lab and the kinetics lab. Those are the two hardest. We also did the easiest one, the silver analysis one. <laughs> Everything else kind of is in, in, in the middle. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is, okay, so let me just draw a picture of a titration. You have a big burette. And in this case, we're gonna put our strong base. It's gonna be a 0.1 molar solution. On the bottom, you've got your beaker. And then typically what you have is a pH probe that will measure the pH of the solution. We're gonna start with a hundred milliliters of our buffer, okay? Um, <clears throat> so yes, pH can be under zero, but for biological systems, we, we pretty much stay between zero and, well, biological systems will stay between zero and 14. But yeah, you can have negative pH values. So the first thing we're gonna do is gonna calculate just the pH of the solution before we add any base. Okay, so my base is in my burette. 
So what is the pH before I add anything? We're going to call that point A. Okay. So before I add any base at all. Now, how did I know that um, the pH is going to be acidic? Well, what I'm doing here is acetic acid and sodium acetate. Maybe I'll write the names here. Because I've got a weak acid, I know that my pH will start acidic, okay? And I can do all of this Calder with a base. I can do all these calculations with a base and it will take just as long, but we're gonna do it with the acid first, okay? So because I'm starting with a weak acid and a salt, my pH is gonna start acidic. You have a question, Kaya? No, sorry. You're too small? All right, so point A, you've got our equation here. I'm just going to rewrite it. Actually, I'm going to write it like this. Now wait till you check out. So I'm just telling you those are our initial concentrations, 0.1 molar and 0.1 molar. What I am gonna do is uh, I'm gonna like sometime during quarter four, uh, after the AP tests are done, I'll pick a day, or actually I'll send an email out and see if there's interest. If you guys wanna come in and just do this lab for fun, we can do it, you know, if you just want to get practice using the pH probes and titrating, because that this, again, these labs that I pick are ones that you would, you'll, would do your freshman year of college. Um, and if it's not your freshman year, you'll definitely do a titration um, in your sophomore year. You all good at home there, Kiara? Can I move on? Yeah, I'm good. All right. So. When we first start off, it's kind of like the problems we've done already. The only difference is instead of starting with a zero here, we're starting with 0.1 molar, okay? Why 0.1 molar? Because I just picked that number out of my head. I've got zero H3 plus, so which direction am I gonna shift here, Tyler? Right. Gonna shift right. Whoops. 0.1 plus x. So right now it doesn't look too bad. It's kind of what we've been doing. A, A is equal to products over reactants. The Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Why? Because I have it memorized. My X is going to be too small. So then X is going to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And that is giving me my concentration of A plus.
So pH is log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So my initial pH is gonna be Four point seven. So at point A, my pH is going to be four point seven four. So now what we're going to start doing is we're going to start adding base. Okay. So I'm going to start adding base. And it's going to drip down into my beaker with my buffer. So the pH is going to change, but a buffered system, the pH won't change much. So what you will see is your pH will start to change, okay? And then it will start to change drastically, okay? We call this region, I'm gonna call it section B, maximum buffering. It will reach an inflection point. I'm gonna call that point C. Point C is called the equivalence point. So the point of inflection is the equivalence point. And I'll define that later. For right now, you can just color it in. And then, We'll get to section D where the pH begins to flatten out again, okay? At each of these sections, there's a different way to calculate the pH, yay. So four different things you gotta do. And so you have to ask yourself, where are you on this graph when you do these problems? So we did point A, that's before you add any base. I was gonna write that there before any base is added. For point B, We'll have added some base. I'm going to say section B because it's really not a point. Section B, maximum buffering region. What do you say, Ethan? Let's say we add, oh, I don't know, 35 milliliters of base. I just picked that number out of my head. <laughs> so when you're in section B, you're gonna to have to do a before and after table and an ice table, okay? So, Remember that the concentration of my base is 0 0.10 molar, okay? Again, I just picked that number out of my head, all right? So how many moles of OH am I adding? So 0 0.035 liters, one liter is 0 0.10 moles. So I'm adding 0 0.0035 moles 
of OH. So what does that base react with? So if we go back and look at our buffered system up here, um, is the sodium hydroxide gonna react with the salt? No. Is it gonna react with the acid? Yes. So before and after tables have to be in moles. Okay. Ice tables are in molarity, before and after tables are in moles. So beforehand, I got 0 0.0035 moles of sodium hydroxide. How much acid did I have beforehand? And again, Zoe, it has to be in moles. So I have 100 milliliters and my molarity is 0.1. So I'm just gonna be very explicit here. I'm gonna sneak it in here. So 0 0.100 liters, one liter, Because this way, if you go back and look at your notes in college, you'll know what you were doing. That's going to be 0 0.0100 moles of the acetic acid. Can you see that? Is that too small, Ethan? You good, Mike? So when these two things react, you can have a double displacement reaction, okay? So you're gonna end up with we don't care about the water, okay? The amount of water generated is negligible. And this is why you have to think about every single problem that you do here. So what do I have more of? Do I have more acid or do I have more base? It's not a trick question, Avery. What do I have, more acid or base? Avery says more acid, he is correct. So when I react, all of my base will be used up. How much acid will be left? And I will generate this much salt. So the base reacts with the acid, the strong base reacts with the acid and produces more salt. So now when I do my ice table,
ice tables are in molarity, right? So what is my molarity of the acetic acid? Well, we, when we started, Ari, it was 0.1 molar, but it's not 0.1 molar anymore because some of it reacted. I now have 0 0.0065 moles of it. Right? But ice tables need to be in molarity. So now I got to convert that to molarity. How much volume do I have? One hundred milliliters. And that's where these problems get ugly. We started with a hundred, but we added thirty-five more milliliters of base. So now our total volume is one hundred and thirty-five. So there's just so much to keep in mind when we do these problems. So my initial molarity is going to be 0 0.048 molar. And what about my salt? Are we starting with 0.1 molar? No. And the reason why is because we generated more salt. So let's see, how many moles did we start with here? There's a 0.1 molar solution. 100 mils. So we started with that many moles, but then we generated 0 0.0035. I'll rate that better. So we, started with the 0 .00, 0 0.01 moles of salt. We generated an additional 0 0.0035 moles of salt. Okay. Do you understand where that's coming from, Kaya? You sure? Yeah. You're looking very perplexed. So my molarity, instead of being 0.1, my molarity is now going to be 0.1. Oh, can't be right. Actually, I still end up with 0.1 molar. I think that's just a coincidence of the numbers that I picked. So I had 35 mils, right? Yep, 35 mils. Yep. 
That's just a coincidence. Now, we still have zero of this. So which direction are we going to shift? Shift right. So the difference in the in the maximum buffering region is you have to do that before and after table and recalculate your starting concentrations. The rest of the problem is going to look the same. And then we can do our Ka problem. Products over reactants. What about my X? Is it too small? Compare this to this. The X is still too small, but realize that if let's say my molarity had changed to 0 0.0048, let's say it was that small, well then my X would not be too small and I'd have to use the quadratic equation, okay? So with all of these problems, I can't just say, this is what you always do. You have to start using some of these guiding principles to think about, okay, what's going on in the situation here. So this is going to be too small. So then the equation simplifies to x times 0.1 over 0 0.048. Solve for x. And I get 8.65 times 10 to the negative sixth. It's the concentration of my H plus. Now I can calculate um, my pH. And I get a pH of 5.06. The homework problems are going to um, be due like, one, two, today's Tuesday. They'll be due Thursday because they will take you quite a bit of time to, to walk through them. Okay. So look at how much my pH changed. So my pH started off as 4.74. I added 35 milliliters of base and my pH barely changed. Went from 4.74 to 5.06, okay? Now the homework is gonna ask you to prove to yourself what would have happened if we didn't have a buffered system. What if you just added um, the base directly to um, the weak acid or the strong acid and it wasn't buffered? You'll see that the pH changes drastically. 
Okay. So what questions do you have right now? No, we, we still have 15 minutes. So. Wait, um, I have a question. Yep. Is the, so the 5.06, is that the C value? No. So what's happening is as I add base, my pH will slowly, slowly change. So we're at. And add some units to this thing. So at 35, 35 mils, the pH is 5.06. So after adding 35 milliliters of base, the pH has gone up from 4.74 up to 5.06. Okay. So anywhere basically between zero and a hundred mils, you're gonna be calculating the pH according to what I just did. Now, I know more stuff than you do right now. So that's why I know it's a hundred mils is the end of the region of part B. Um, later on, well actually right now in part C, I'm gonna to prove to you why I know that it stops at 100 mils, okay? Because at part C is where we hit the equivalence point, okay? We have to define the equivalence point. Does that make sense to you, Kiera, that we're at, at 35 milliliters of base that we added, we're at a pH of 5.06? Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. And as you continue to add base, the pH will go up and up and all of a sudden it will go up very quickly in a short amount of time. And that's where it's very useful to do the titration. So maybe, like I said, if there's interest in, at the end of quarter four after the AP tests, we, I'll set up an optional time. All right, part C, the anticipation is building. At the equivalence point, the moles of Strong base and weak acid are equal. At the equivalence point, the moles of strong base and weak acid are equal. Conversely, if we were doing bases, we would say the strong acid and the weak base are equal. So we can do all this logic with bases, but I'll for right now define it. In this case, the strong acid, uh, the strong base and the weak acid are equal. Now, what strong base are we using in this case? Sodium hydroxide. In this case, what weak acid are we using? Acetic. But it could be any strong base. It could be any weak acid. Oh yeah, I'll post this to YouTube because I'll, I'll know your friends are gonna wanna watch this. So um, if I'm at the equivalence point, Luis, the moles of the strong base and the moles of the weak acid are equal. So then I know 
I must have that many moles of base, okay? By definition, when I'm at the equivalence point, I gotta have that number, okay? So when they react, I will have no more acid. All of the acid will have reacted. Again, the amount of water being generated is insignificant, so I don't care. I, actually, maybe I'll just write don't care. I don't care about the water. There's usually one student that says, well, isn't the, the water you're creating affecting the volume insignificant? 0 0.01 moles of water isn't even like a tenth of a mil. Okay, so it's not doing anything. So now when we do our ice table, oh, yeah, so actually don't write this down, okay? So initially, now we have no acid. I generated 0 0.0100 moles of that, but I have to add to that what I had started with before, right? Because I started with 0 0.01 moles and I generated an additional 0 0.01 moles, okay? So, um, When you hit point C, we no longer have any acid, okay? There's no acid. So it ceases to be a Ka problem and shifts over to being a Kb problem. Okay, so like we did Ka, Ka, okay? Because we had some acid present. Now at point C, boop, boop, it's no longer an acid problem. It becomes a KB problem. What happens is the conjugate base reacts with water to produce that. So this is the reaction that's happening. And then we set up an ice table for this. Ice tables always already have to be molarity. So I've got 0 0.01 moles that I started with, plus an additional that I generated. I have zero acid and I have zero OH. Molarity is moles divided by liters. Okay, so what is my volume down here? Well, I picked 0 0.1 molar and 0 0.1 molar for a reason. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit. I'll come back up. So the equivalence point 
is when the moles of the weak acid and the weak and the strong base are equal, right? So if I've got a hundred mils of a 0.1 molar solution. The equivalence point would tell me that I have to have the equal number of the moles of the base, the strong base. So I picked my molarity to be 0.1. So how much volume would I have added in order to get 0 0.01 moles of NaOH? So a hundred mils, Mike, would give me that much, right? You can do stoichiometry, a hundred mils times that gives me 0 0.01 moles, right? Now, what if the molarities weren't the same? Like on the AP test, they're gonna give you the molarities to be the same so that you can do it in your head, okay? I knew it'd be 100 mils. That's why when I do my graph, I put the equivalence point at 100 mils because I knew once I added 100 mils of base, I'd be at the equivalence point. But now that you know what the equivalence point is, what if my concentration wasn't the same? What if it was twice as strong? How many milliliters would I have to add to get to the equivalence point? If I'm twice as strong, I should be able to add half the volume, okay? So the equivalence point is the moles, okay? The moles of the strong base and the weak acid are equal, not the volumes, okay? So I have a hundred mils of this and I got 50 of that. Okay, now they're gonna give you numbers that you can do in your head, like 0.1. Well, okay, what's twice of 0 0.1, 0 0.2? You know, they're not gonna give you some goofy number like 0.33. So granted, you can multiply it by two, but it just gets harder, okay? Plus, they may want you to draw the graph, okay? But for our problem, we said it was the same molarity So my total volume is going to be 0 0.200 liters. Because I started with 100, right? I started with 100 mils and I added another 100 mils. So my initial molarity is going to be 0 0.10 molar. So which direction am I gonna to shift? To the right, to the right, to the right. I don't have any acid, it all reacted. 0.1 minus X, X, X. The KB problem. So X times X or 0.1 minus X. they're not gonna give you the KB. You're gonna to have to calculate it. 
So in order to calculate the KB Kara, you know that KA times KB is equal to KW. So my KA is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth times KB is equal to one times 10 to the negative 14th. So then you can calculate KB. Just hold on. Don't go running off yet. Just hold on. So this is my KB, okay? So, so then you can go back and um, finish calculating. And we'll, we'll finish this problem. But if you want to start, of course you want to start. Um, numbers 18. 19, 21, and 25, okay? Th those problems will actually, the first two are easy, the other two will take you some time, okay? So those won't be due till Thursday, okay? All right, you guys have a great day. Um, let's see how far we get tomorrow and see how uh, confused you look tomorrow. That is the first buffer set. Yeah, I mean, that is the first uh, problem set. But I don't think anybody started that Calder. Um, maybe some people started these problems, but I, didn't, I, don't, I don't think anybody started these. And Calder, I won't post this on YouTube until this afternoon, okay? Could you um, scroll up real quick back to the eye table? Okay, thank you. You can sit anywhere as long as you're three feet from somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I locked the prom set called her because I didn't want anybody trying to do it. <laughs> you can sit wherever you want as long as you're three feet from somebody. I'm not going to bother making a student charge for two days. <laughs>